Karen Stoll for the Library Director. We're pleased to welcome back author Ray Sinibaldi. Mrs. Sinibaldi has written extensively about baseball, and the Red Sox in particular, but as you'll see tonight, he's also extremely knowledgeable about the Kennedys, and will provide you with a look at Camelot. He'll be discussing his newest book, Jackie's Newport, America's First Lady and the City by the Sea, as well as his previous title, JFK in New England. So thank you all for coming, and I will let him take over. Perfect. <laughs> thank you, Karen. It's, uh, you know, what the, poet, the old poet once said, I don't know who it was, but you can never go home again. Not true. I always feel like I come home, especially when I'm here. I was telling Karen a little while ago that I need to pay rent to her. I spent so much time here this week. Um, I do a lot of writing here when, I'm, when I travel and come home, and it's a, it's a good place. It, it, uh, it's a warm and fuzzy. But anyway, thank you all for coming. Um, I never tire of talking about uh, one of my most favorite subjects. It's, a, uh, it's been a passion of mine for quite a while. And now that I have joined the ranks of the retired, I've had the opportunity to spend some time uh, delving in and actually, actually writing about it. So I'm going to, um, these two books uh, that are on the rack here, two of them, uh, Jackie's new book came out the 1st of June. And John F. Kennedy, From Florida to the Moon, came out the 1st of, uh, the 1st of July. So I kind of combined these two in the 50th anniversary of, um, of the moonshot, the moon landing. Hard, for, hard to believe that it's been 50 years since we did that. And I can't tell you how many times throughout the course of a year in school I would have to answer questions about Mr. Singh. You know, we really didn't land on the moon. Right? You know, so anyway, with all that nonsense put aside. Um, but uh, I'd like to begin with a, with a couple, of, uh, couple of quotes here. Um, I don't think anything was more of a manifestation of the vision, the spirit, and the leadership of John F. Kennedy than the goal to reach the moon, okay? And up there, I don't know if you can really see that, but it says on the, on the left hand at the top there, it says, we choose to go to the moon, and uh, we choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. I cannot tell you how many times I echo that, I did it in my classroom. I do it with my baseball team that I coach in Florida. Um, it's easy to do the easy things. But the reason is, as, uh, as uh, JFK said, because that goal will serve to organize the very best in our energies and skills, and because that challenge is not one we are willing to forego and we actually intend to win. So this is really a clarion call. And I'll get into some specifics of the space race as we get into the, into, the, uh, into the topic here tonight. On the other side, you see Mrs. Kennedy. Um, and I love this quote. I think my biggest achievement is that after going through a rather difficult time, I consider myself comparatively sane. OK? She made that. She just said that in the 1980s. So I wanna, I'm just going to read you. One page from this book right here. With silent, stoic grandeur, Jackie Kennedy seared the soul of America. Bold and stout-hearted, she walked out of Parkland Hospital, her hand gently resting on Jack's coffin. With an abiding conviction, she refused to change her blood-stained suit, facing the world wearing the scars of her personal horror. With dignified majesty, she held the hands of her children while their father's flag-draped coffin left the White House for the final time. In a solemn, woeful moment, standing at the foot of the 36 Capitol steps, again her children in hand, she watched as their daddy's casket was removed from the caisson. The Marine Corps band played hail to the chief, piercing her heart, and for seconds, only seconds, she lowered her head and wept, her shoulders shuddering in the spasm of her shattered soul. Standing stately in the Capitol rotunda, she watched and listened while her husband was placed on the catafalque, with statuette poise, she listened while men of power eulogized him. With nurturing gentleness, she led Caroline to the bier, nailing and gently kissing the flag that covered Jack's coffin before hand in hand, mother and daughter exited down those same 36 steps. Elegant, erect, and valiant, she walked behind his horse-drawn caisson from the White House to St. Matthew's Cathedral. With a delicate tenderness, she comforted her daughter, who during her daddy's funeral was overcome, crushed with the magnitude of her loss. With a soft, loving whisper, she brought her three-year-old son to attention, and he saluted his daddy's flag-draped coffin. With a stirring grace, she ignited the flame at his graveside, ensuring that her husband 
would eternally pass the torch to new generations of Americans. With courage and august nobility, she walked, head held high, behind a black veil, brave and polished, daunted, not broken, but steadfast and determined that her husband would not be lost to history or forgotten by his people. The mighty of the world walked behind her, and with the bold conviction of every step, she stared down the face of evil which took him from her. Jacqueline Lee Bouvier Kennedy, the woman with no official government title or function, led the world to Arlington National Cemetery to lay to rest her beloved Jack Kennedy, 35th President of the United States. She set out to mark his place in history and the history of his country. She became the symbol of American courage, grace, strength, resilience, and determination, and thus marked her place as well. Just a rather difficult time. Um, that embodied in that basically is really where she stepped out from being sort of a legend into an icon, I mean, almost instantaneously. And all of this, and she was 34 years old. I keep forgetting that, but I said she was 34 years old. I think back to when I was 34 years old. I'm not sure I remembered my middle name at that point in time. Camelot comes from um, the great, I mean, Jack, Jackie began to begin basically shaping President Kennedy's legacy, and she did it almost instant instantaneously on the plane coming back from Dallas, okay? Um, the Camelot moniker, if you will, it comes from, a, it came from a, a, came from us from two guys, actually, named, um, named White. Terrence White, who was this gentleman, uh, the gentleman right over there in the, the white hair and the glasses, he had written a series of Arthurian novels, the first in 1938 called The Sword and the Stone, which he had written. Uh, he wrote a collection of them in 1958, which was then taken by a gentleman named, gentleman, gentleman named Lerner in Lowe, and it developed into a play, a Broadway musical. Uh, Lerner was a classmate of, Ted, of uh, President Kennedy's, and Two weeks after the president's assassination, Jackie sat with Theodore H. White, this gentleman down here with the glasses facing us. Um, the original cast of, of Camelot is over there. And then there, you'll, you probably will not recognize two, although you'll recognize the names. Uh, Robert Goulet played Lancelot. And he was indeed, this, this catapulted him to, to stardom. The guy on the other side on the right end played Mordred, and that was Roddy McDowell, a very young Roddy McDowell, who would go on to gigantic fame, mostly as the Planet of the Apes guy. He was, uh, he was in that. Um, the other two, you might recognize Richard Burton and Julie Andrews. Um, two pretty good talents in their, in their own right. But Teddy White, in the interview, and uh, with Jack, Jackie told him that uh, Jack would put on the old record players, the old Victrolas, and he would put the musical on at night. That was one of the things that he liked to do. And, um, and she said to him, she said, there'll be other great presidents, Mr. White. She said, but there'll never be a, another Camelot. He wrote that in Life Magazine of December 7th, and that sort of set the tone, and that is how the name Camelot came to be, came to be basically uh, in, in association with the, with the Kennedy administration. What I'm going to do is take on a little chronology of how they quickly arrived at, at, uh, at the presidency and then through the presidency as well. Uh, Jackie came to Newport in 1942 at the age of 12, one month before her 13th birthday. Uh, you'll see that little note in the middle there. Uh, that's um, Jackie's mom, and the gentleman below was her father. He sued for divorce. Jack Bouvier was a, was a stockbroker on Wall Street who had a... Um, as Charles Spaulding put it, a rather intense relationship with alcohol. Um, he was, uh, she filed for divorce after uh, they were leaning on a fence post together watching Jackie uh, perform her, her equestrian, which she had been doing since she was three. She was a very accomplished equestrian. And um, behind there was, Janet was sitting on the fence, behind her was Jack Bouvier, and behind him was his girlfriend, and he's holding hands with his girlfriend. Some AP photographer snapped a photograph. This ended up in the newspaper. And after that, Janet, Janet uh, uh, filed for divorce. Uh, but in 1942, a Lieutenant Junior Grade by the name of Jack Kennedy, when they moved to Newport, she came to Newport first in June of 42, um, to summer in Newport. She had lived in the Hamptons, summered in the Hamptons um, throughout most of her life at that time. And uh, there was a lieutenant junior grade right across the bay at Quonset uh, Naval Base doing P-51 
PT boat training, and that was uh, so they literally were across the bay from each other when President Kennedy was uh, was training is uh, doing naval training, and Jackie was a 13-year-old girl, literally, who was um, in charge of gathering the eggs every morning because it was still a working farm. Hammersmith Farm would, would be the last working farm um, in, uh, in Newport. Jackie graduated from uh, George Washington University in 1951. Um, on the left-hand side, uh, the left-hand side, you'll see there's a little note. Jackie's ambition when she graduated from high school um, Farmington, she said her ambition was not to be a housewife. Very interesting. She was a she was kind of stepping out. She graduated in 1951 after studying for a year at the Sorbonne in Paris. She came back, and um, as at that time, five percent of women in the United States had college degrees. Um, she was one of five percent. In uh, May of 1995, you'll see in the right at George Washington University, they dedicated a, uh, a hall in her, in her honor, in her memory. That was a year after she had passed away. Up on the, uh, a little bit uh, further, further north, you had John F. Kennedy. This, uh, this photograph here is a, uh, taken at, um, at Harvard University when he was a senior in college by a friend. Um, that's in, and he, uh, up top you'll see a, him signing a book. That gentleman on top, uh, up top looking upon with a smile is Spencer Tracy. 1938, his book, uh, his book uh, Why England Slept. It was his, uh, his thesis from Harvard. He had studied, he was very, very interested in uh, international international relations at a very, very young age. And by the time he had graduated from Harvard, he had tra traveled extensively throughout Europe, even visiting, visiting the Soviet Union. That was always his, his, mo his most of his interest lay in, uh, in international affairs. The book is about, about England falling asleep before World War, World War II. And um, he is signing a copy for, uh, for Spencer Tracy there. In 1940, uh, 45, 40, he announced, January of 1945, he announced the run at Congress, fulfilling the, the basically kind of taken over for his older brother who had been killed uh, in World War II after he had been missing for nine days in the Pacific. Um, and they, they presumed that he was dead because they found his boat broken to pieces. Um, he came back in. He really had not really very much interest in politics uh, at that time, but he did... Uh, he became more and more interested in it, especially with dad saying, you got to pick up his brother. his brother. His brother was being groomed to be the first Catholic president of the United States from the time he was a young, he was a young man. And many folks say he was far better suited for it, although this guy did a pretty good job of getting there himself once he got, uh, once he got, into, the, uh, once he got into the mix, so to speak. Jackie, uh, 1951. Jack gets introduced to, uh, to Jackie by the Bartlett's. Um, they tried in 1948. Charles Bartlett was a neighbor in Hyannisport, um, and he actually knew Jackie. He was from New York, so he knew Jackie from, from the Hamptons, and he knew, he knew Jack from being a neighbor in Hyannisport, and he tried to bring the two of them together in 1948 uh, at his brother's wedding. It didn't quite work out, because Jackie got to chatting with uh, former heavyweight champion uh, boxer Jack Dempsey, uh, so they, they didn't make it. But in 1951, it did happen. At the time, Jackie on the left was working as, as a, for the Washington Examiner as what was called the Inquiring Camera Girl, where she would go around Washington and she would pick out congressmen, senators, Washingtonians, and ask them particular questions, and they would run this little column uh, in the newspaper um, with her photographs. And in one Interestingly enough, in one edition of The Inquiring Camera Girl, she photographed and asked Congressman, newly elected Congressman Richard Nixon and newly elected Congressman John Kennedy, both the class of 1946, the same question. And there, that photograph appeared in the, which was, which obviously turned out to be pretty prophetic. While the, she was doing that, Jack was running for the Senate. He had had uh, three terms in Congress, and he was now running for the Senate. The photograph that you see there, it's a, um, it's a little personal story that goes with that. If you look at Jack Kennedy, he is looking at a young lady um, across. In between them, you'll see a very smiling, a very happy guy who is standing there smiling. That gentleman's name is William Kelly. 
That is my paternal grandfather. Um, he was, uh, I was telling this young lady earlier, uh, my interest in the Kennedy, in, in the presidency and history and in, and in the Kennedys came in the, in the fact that my grandfather had worked as his campaign secretary in East Boston, both in 1946 and then again here in 1952. This was taken at the Copley Plaza. The interesting thing about this for me, you'll see that that, that picture appeared in the, in the newspaper. And I had, from my grandfather, I have that old cutout photograph that is now yellow and soon to fall apart, I'm sure. I'm doing the best I can to preserve it. But when I was at, and, and what it is is, all you can see in it is you can see uh, Congressman Kennedy, you can see the lady, and you, it's, it's kind of cropped, right? It's squared off there. So the people to the left, the right of Jack Kennedy, your left, you'll see a woman on the end there who was standing there in a fur coat. Well, I had this, photo, this, this newspaper photograph literally for 50 years, whatever it is, for a long time. And I found the original photograph at the JFK Library, and that lady in the fur coat is my grandmother. So that was really, that was, it turned out to be pretty cool that, that Nana actually made it into the picture. And she used to host the famous teas and all that kind of stuff, so she was, uh, she was pretty active in it well. And she was an Italian woman who had a fishmonger's voice. So my sister tells a story of when they were at the, we were at the a rally at the Boston Garden of her yelling to him over the crowd and him actually catching her voice and coming over to say hello. Uh, John F. Kennedy won the election to the Senate. Uh, you'll see below that uh, Herder was elected governor. You'll see it says Kennedy the victor. Uh, that was pretty much an upset. He defeated Henry Cabot Lodge. Henry Cabot Lodge was a very popular Senate. And of course, the lodges go all the way back to the days of George Washington. They were very popular. Um, but Kennedy defeated him. And the, the other irony that he defeated him, he de defeated him in a year, you'll see it's a 39 states like Ike. So 39 of the uh, then 48 states um, went for Eisenhower. So Eisenhower, Republican, long coattails, went in a landslide. And then a young Jack Kennedy defeated defeated Henry Cabot Lodge to become the junior senator of the United States. So in 1952, when the Eisenhower was, in, was elected president, the inauguration, obviously the newly elected senator was going. Before they went to the inaugural ball, there was a cocktail party held at Jack Kennedy's uh, a house in Georgetown that he shared with his sister Patricia. Jacqueline Kennedy, just, uh, they were just talking about getting married. Um, and she was obviously there. She was going as well. She was 23 years old. Jack was 35. Lem Billings, a long friend of, of John Kennedy's, uh, met him in middle school at Choate. He, uh, he made it his business to take young Jacqueline Bouvier aside and basically had a sit down talk with her. This is very interestingly in the um, Interesting, interestingly told, um, Billings did it in an interview for the JFK Library in which he basically told her, you know, Jack's 35, um, he's, he's been out with lots of women, and essentially what, she, what he said to her was, don't think that fidelity is any part of this equation, essentially. Jackie said later on that she kind of took that as a challenge. But it's, I think it's an, it's an interesting point because it adds to, to me, looking back in the rearview mirror, this is what added to me the, um, the inner strength of this woman. On top of everything else she endured, as we will see, she endured a, um, a marriage where he was essentially a serial philanderer. I mean, he would make Bill Clinton look like a choir boy. Um, also in 1952, John F. Kennedy met Verna Von Braun for the first time. It was in New York at a, at a, at a dinner. Uh, for they were, they were taking nominees for Time Magazine's Man of the Year. Um, he sat at the dinner table with him, and Verna Von Braun has said, it's, it, it was interesting to note, but afterwards he said to his wife, um, I believe that one day this young man may in fact be President of the United States. He was, Von Braun, obviously a rocket, literally the genius of a rocket scientist, uh, was absolutely encapsulated with Kennedy's unbelievable intellectual curiosity and wanting details. 
So he would talk, I mean, he was, he was fascinated by it. This relationship would grow, obviously, when Kennedy became president, and we began to build, to build space, space rockets. But um, I, I kind of I kinda like the fact, my grandfather also, in 1952, introduced Jack Kennedy at, a, um, at the East Boston High School at a campaign rally as the future president of the United States. So I now have found out, I can relate to my family, that Grandpa and Verna Von Braun were on the same page. <laughs> <laughs> September 12, 1953, Newport hosts the social event of the year. This wedding was compared to um, the Astor weddings and the Vanderbilt weddings of the early 1900s in Newport. Thousands upon thousands of people came there. Very interesting story. You'll see in the bottom, this is uh, the back at Hammersmith Farm, that, that photograph in between, which kind of gives you the whole deal. There was about 3,000 people that came to, the, uh, came to the church and about 1,000 that came to the reception. You can see the crowd that is gathered around St. Mary's Church. Uh, St. Mary's, every Tuesday in the summertime, they have a tour of the church. That, uh, set, that will allow you to go back and they talk about the days of Camelot. A lot of, a lot of interesting stuff uh, regarding that. Uh, that wasn't even their church. They were really, their church was on the other side of town, but there was some, there was some music problems. Um, they had selected the music. The Catholic Church at that time had new encyclical and coming down from Pope Pius about what music was acceptable in a Catholic marriage, what was not, and all that kind of stuff, and basically, the other people said no, so they said okay. So they went, they went across town to St. Mary's, and as you say, the rest, the rest is history. So that's 1953. Um, in 1955, Jackie uh, becomes pregnant for the first time, and that pregnancy ends in a miscarriage. And we'll get, I'll get back to that later. But the CDC says that about 20 percent of of, um, of pregnancies end in a in a, in a miscarriage. Um, in 19, uh, that was 1955. In 1956 was the Democratic National Convention. Jackie went to the, de to the convention with him, and this, was, this presented a very interesting story in, in the story of John F. Kennedy. John F. Kennedy was running for president. According to Jackie's tapes, John F. Kennedy was running for president the day, the day he was elected to the Senate. And she talks freely in her interviews with Arthur Schlesinger, and she says, oh, I can remember them talking about it even when he was campaigning for the Senate. So this was something that was always on the radar. In 1956, it was, as it was going closer and closer, Adlai Stevenson was nominated again for the Democratic ticket in 1956. He had been trounced by Eisenhower in 1952. And Stevenson did something very unusual, and he did not select a running mate. He threw it open to the convention. It's a highly unusual maneuver, but he threw it open to the convention, at which point Jack Kennedy wanted it. And what you had was about a day and a half of the old-fashioned fist-pumping, arm-twisting, cigar-smoked rooms, I need your vote, I need your vote, I need your vote, and you know, he wanted to go for it. One of the, one of the uh, cherished um, items of Kennedy collectors is a pin that says, John F. Kennedy for vice president. If you find one of them, Grab it and cherish it. They're very, very valuable because obviously there weren't many of them. They just had them made up in a day. They went around the convention hall. Uh, actually, he, he came very, very close on the first ballot, but then after that it fell apart. His father was out of his mind crazy, telling him, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. It's a losing ticket. You don't want to be part of it. He went and did it anyway. He didn't win. And when he called his father afterwards, he said, it's the best thing that happened to you. Because what ended up happening is he became a winner. Because at the, as the vote was going forward, he stepped up and he called for the convention by unanimous decree to declare Estes Kefauver of the vice president, which they did. He gave a resounding speech. And when the convention was over, everybody was talking about this young Jack Kennedy. And he actually just act, expanded his, his, his view on the national scene. So he became a winner in that regard. However. He then took off for um, the Mediterranean with his brother Teddy, um, his college roommate Torby McDonald, who was a, a uh, state senator in the state of Massachusetts, and a Florida senator by the name of George Smathers. So they went out, literally went out, they were unreachable. They were out in the Mediterranean sailing um, with wine, women, and more women. Um, four days. 
into that trip, um, Jackie goes back to Newport. She goes home to Newport. She is pregnant. She's seven months pregnant at the time. And four days into that trip, she's had, taking a nap at her bedroom in Newport. And she wakes up screaming. Um, basically, her uterus had separated. And she was rushed to the hospital where she gave birth to a stillborn baby girl. That girl, um, they, had, they had a name for her. They were going to name her Arabella. Um, you, that little photograph you see there, it is in that cemetery, St. Columbus Cemetery in Middleton, Rhode Island, which is just across Narragansett Bay, um, is where she was buried. But more on that later. So that's 1956. 1957, two things happen of great significance. One, Russia launches Sputnik, which absolutely terrified the United States. Absolutely terrified us. They had a, um, that occurred on October, October 4th, 1957. The Soviet Union had detonated a hydrogen bomb in 1955, making them the second nation to have atomic power. And now with this, they also were telling us they had a delivery system for that bomb as well. Um, it was not a very comfortable time in America. I don't remember that. I was crawling around in my diapers then. Um, I don't recall it specifically, but I do know the impact that it had. Um, in interestingly enough, as the United States was trying to launch, they, they sped up their attempt. And um, their first attempt after this, literally, you've probably all seen it. You can find it on YouTube. It went up, and then it exploded on the, on the launch pad, essentially. And headlines all across the country called it, they, all it said was Kaputnik. They had Sputnik, we had Kaputnik. Um, but in November of 1957, Jackie gave birth to Caroline Bouvier Kennedy. Um, I love this photograph. I'm not sure I, there is, I, I find a photograph of absolute genuine happiness and contentment and joy on Jackie's face as is captured. Uh, this is at Caroline's, um, Caroline's baptism in December of 1957. That craggly looking gentleman on the right is Richard Cardinal Cushing. The campaign goes on, 1958. This is just various shots of Jack, Jackie campaigning with him. The one down below in the middle is taken in 1958 campaign in Framingham. It's a Columbus Day parade. I love that photograph. That was relatively new at the JFK Library. It had come in within the last couple of years. Folks going through stuff. Somebody's grandmother had taken it, and they sent it to the library. But this is um, the, the top left is Jack and Jackie in uh, campaigning in Wisconsin. Uh, she wasn't a big fan of the campaign. She did it, but she wasn't really a big fan of it. Um, interestingly enough, she liked. Um, she was not crazy about the folks in Wisconsin. She found them to be very kind of standoffish. She loved the people of West Virginia. And the people of West Virginia, they thought that Jack Kennedy had no chance of carrying West Virginia in 1960 primary. Um, a very, very highly Protestant state. His Catholicism was a huge issue at the time. Um, but uh, there's, there's a great tape of an old West Virginian talking about Jack Kennedy and how they fell in love with Jack Kennedy because she took her shoes off and just put her feet up on the seat, just like we do. And it was just these simple gestures like that. But the, uh, there's two of them on the right side are in, are in West Virginia, which he carried rather handily over Hubert Humphrey. And that kind of that's, was pretty significant in his quest for the presidency. In 1960, he's elected president. Um, pretty close to the popular vote. One of the closest elections still to this day. He only won by 112,000 in the popular vote. I think he ended up with 303 electoral votes. So he won pretty significantly in that. And there are still folks today who say that uh, this election was stolen. Uh, probably in Cook, they point to Cook County in Ohio, where um, apparently a lot of dead people voted uh, that particular year. Uh, but anyway, also what took place in November of 1960, on November 25th, about two weeks, two and a half weeks after the election, is John F. Kennedy Jr. was born. And I just love that picture of his sister giving him a, giving him a big kiss. Jack, Jack Kennedy said, as he, he said, we now, uh, my wife and I prepare for a new administration and a new baby. Um, he was born, John Kennedy Jr. was born with a condition called hyaline membranes disease. As he was four weeks premature. His lungs were not fully developed. Um, he was touch and go for a bit, but obviously, he, uh, he battled through that. More on that later. Obviously, the inauguration. Um, 
these are just various various uh, sites of the uh, of the inauguration. I like the one that's coming out of the house in Georgetown on the left, where they had they had they had owned a home. Um, in the middle, you'll see in the black and white, you see that guy with the white hair, that's got all that. Yeah, that's um, that's Robert Frost, who was the first poet ever to be invited to recite at an inauguration by a president. Um, this was indeed, and this was kind of an interesting marriage, if you will, the octogenarian poet and the youngest man ever elected president, and they kind of merged on this, uh, on this scene. Um, it was an unbelievably snowy day the night before, and then the next day it was crisp and clear and cold in Washington, D.C. Kennedy, he went, you can see the photographs of him giving his speech. The hat's gone, he's got no overcoat. Um, you know, this was indeed, interestingly to know, Dwight Eisenhower at the time was the youngest man ever elected, I mean the oldest man ever elected president. Kennedy is the youngest man ever elected president. Following in again, his wife at this time is 31. He's got two little kids, so the face of America is really about to change. The interesting thing about, um, about Frost was he wrote a poem and he called it Dedication. Uh, was the name of the poem. He later, he later changed the name of it to, uh, for JFK on his inauguration. He couldn't read it. The snow was so blinding. And it was, you, know, you know what happens after a snowstorm. You get that bright blue sky and the snow. And there's, you know, there was a, a foot and a half of snow all over the place. And it actually blinded him. So he could not read it. So what he did was he just, he just, he just recited his poem, The Gift Outright, but from memory. And that's what he did, but he gave him the, uh, he gave him the thing. For, the ending of it goes like this, and it's very appropriate for that day. The glory of a next Augustan age, of a power leading from its strength and pride, of young ambition eager to be tried, firm in our free beliefs without dismay in any game the nations want to play, a golden age of poetry and power, of which this noon day's the beginning hour. He never got to say it, he never got to read it, but that was uh, Robert Frost, who happens to be my favorite poet. He ain't bad. Now Jackie takes full stage, okay? Jackie steps into the White House, and she is astounded at how ratty it is. She cannot believe it. The first thing that astounds her is all the wooden floors have little holes in them, little tiny holes. They look like pinpricks. And she says to her, Jack, what is this? And he... And Kennedy laughed. He said, that's Ike. Ike. Eisenhower was a great golfer. Well, back in those days, golf shoes had spikes, little metal spikes. He'd wear them in the White House when he was practicing his putting. He would put on his golf shoes, and he would walk around the White House while he was practicing his putting. This absolutely horrified Jackie. But she got the idea and actually began basically turning the house into a museum. She went looking for period pieces. She founded what we call today the, uh, the White House Historical Association. She founded that, that book on the right-hand side of the White House that you can now go get there. She put that book together. The first one, they sold it for a buck or whatever. And all this was raising money for the White House Association because she wanted to do is she wanted to purchase period furniture or original furniture if she could as she was developing these rooms, these rooms in the White House. Probably there are two really cool stories that I like a lot. One is that she found a bust, 150-year-old bust of George Washington on a sink in a men's room in the basement at the White House. And she, what is this doing here? She brought that up. That now is on display. But my favorite story is the Resolute Desk. Now, the Resolute Desk was a gift to, to, from Queen Victoria to President Rutherford B. Hayes. And it's called the Resolute Desk because it was built from the English oak timbers of a British Arctic exploration ship that had sunk. Okay? It was raised, and she, they put it together, and they sent it as a gift. Rutherford B. Hayes used it. It kind of went, it, it, a lot of guys used it. Uh, many presidents after Hayes has, in fact, used it. Um, the next guy, Franklin Roosevelt, and if you notice on the bottom, Franklin Roosevelt had a, um, he had a, the, the, the front put in because he wanted to be able to close the door so that people who photographed him would not see his, would not see his, his braces that he was wearing. 
uh, from his polio. So that was kind of interesting. And of course, it became very famous photographs of Caroline and the kids and John crawling through there all the time. Um, but that, um, that desk was used by, only re it's only been removed since, since then from the White House once. And that was when John F. Kennedy, uh, after his assassination, Lyndon Johnson had to go and went on tour as they were raising money for the JFK Library. Um, and then it kind of went into storage. Jimmy Carter brought it back to the Oval Office in 1977. Uh, Reagan has used it. Clinton has used it. George W. Bush has used it. Barack Obama has used it. And President Trump is using it today. The only president who didn't use it in the Oval Office was uh, Bush 41. And that's because he kept it in his own private study in the White House. And that's where he wanted the resolute desk. So it now has been a, it's been a, um, you know, it's obviously been a, um, become a mainstay in the White House. But that was found in a storeroom in the cellar up on its side. And Jackie said, what is this? And why, and why is this here? So um, now we moved on to April, uh, April 12th on, in 1961. Another crazy thing happens that's not too good for the United States, and that is the fact that um, Yuri Gagarin is blasted into space, becoming the first man into orbit. So now we lost with Sputnik. We're losing again. It is interesting to note for me that um, I, I, do, I believe, I am fairly certain in saying that not one day passed during Kennedy's White House stay that there was not something said, written, communicated, meeting, memo, something regarding our quest for space. Okay? So now we're, you know, and that was, it became, the missile gap, if you will, became part of the campaign, um, you know, and, and, and might have had something to do with the fact that, you know, JFK was jumping on the fact that while, while they were sleeping, while Nixon and Eisenhower were sleeping, this is what, this is what was going on. So on April 12th, and we're, we're, we're working towards it, we got nothing yet, but we're working towards it, and then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, Yuri Gagarin goes up and comes down and successfully orbits, okay? That's on April 12th. It didn't help at all our standing in the world or even in the country five days later when uh, the Bay of Pigs invasion took place in Cuba, which turned out to be an absolute disaster. And after that was over, and Kennedy said, amazingly enough, Kennedy went before the American public in a press conference and basically said, I'm the executive officer, the buck stops here. This was a plan that he had inherited from the Eisenhower administration to go take back Cuba. He said okay, he put his stamp on it. He did say, however, it will not be, it will, cannot involve American troops, planes, ships, men. And the CIA had been training this Cuban nationalist force for, since Castro had taken over in 1959. Well, they actually, had, and they said to me, you don't have to worry about it, Mr. President, because once they hit the beach, they're all gonna, they're all going to, um, the Cubans are gonna join in the fight and they'll take back the country. Well, they knew that wasn't true. Um, they just thought that Kennedy would probably say, well, he'd give in at the moment. Well, he didn't give in, and it was a disaster. And um, so he went out, he said, this is my fault. And the next day, his popularity was at 81%. And he said to Dave Powers, the worse we do, the better they like us. And it, it was just inter it was interesting that that, that that happened. And you know what, he never had, he, his popularity was never higher than it was the week after the Bay of Pigs, which is kind of interesting. Well, then we had to step up some stuff, and now we have this guy that all of you who remember will remember, a name that's very familiar to us all who lived through it, Alan Shepard. So now this is April 17th. Now we're on the 6th of May, and Alan Shepard goes up for a one 15-minute um, suborbital flight. But it is huge. It is absolutely humongous for us. And now I'm just going to say this for now. This is May 6th. Okay, bear that. Bear that in mind, because uh, I'll get another story for you that just takes place about three weeks later. In the meantime, they're about to make their first state visit. And Jackie Kennedy is about to go out and become the most important force in the Kennedy administration. On May 15th, they go up to Canada, first state visit, leaving the country as president and first lady. The ambassador to Canada comes over to uh, Jackie's office and says, I need to speak to you. Not on the phone. He comes over. He doesn't speak to Mrs. Kennedy, but he speaks to Tish Baldridge, who was her social secretary. And he said, 
He said, I, wa I just want the First Lady to understand something. Canadians are not like Americans. They're very staid. They're not as exuberant. They're not as emotional. He said, I have problems whenever Queen Elizabeth comes to visit. She is always disturbed by the fact that there's no, that there's no exuberance. She thinks they don't like her. And I have to go through this every time the Queen comes to visit. So tell her not to take it personal, but they're just not like Americans. I just don't want her, exp I don't want her to think disparagingly about the people of Canada. It's just the way we are. So they go to Canada and the place goes berserk. 50,000 people line the streets and half of them are screaming, Jackie, Jackie, Jackie. And they, they want her as much as they, as they want him. Um, you'll notice in the top right hand corner, that's a, that's a tradition that had started in Canada two presidents earlier where a visiting president would plant a tree. You'll see them both kind of turning dirt over. The president severely injured his back in that little endeavor and it would cost him dearly. He was on his way now, this is the 15th of May, the end of May and the beginning of June, he was going to Paris to see de Gaulle and he was going to a summit meeting with Khrushchev in Vienna. And he literally spent every moment away from everybody in a tub with water as hot as he could stand it because he messed up his back. But as you can see, Jackie was, uh, was loved by all. More of that later. So now May 6th was Alan Shepard. On May 25th, President Kennedy goes before a joint meeting of the House and he gives a speech and he says, I believe that this country should set its sights on sending a man to the moon and bringing him back safely to Earth by the end of the decade. Okay? The guy to the right is Gene Krantz. Gene Krantz was noted for the white vest. If you saw the movie Apollo 13, he was played by Ed Harris. That's the guy on the far right. Okay, he was the guy that said failure is not an option. He is still alive. He was a Korean war pilot. That is him up top of the microphone. That's him recently. He is 90 some odd years old. Gene Krantz tells the story that when, when NASA saw President Kennedy say we should try to do this, they literally said to each other, he is crazy. He's lost his mind. He said, we haven't even been in orbit yet. We got one suborbital flight. But Krantz said a very interesting thing began to happen. And he said it happened to him and it was happening to other guys. And he said he went home that night and he was thinking, my God, what faith this guy has in us. This is unbelievable that he trusts that we can really pull this off. NASA in those days was comprised primarily of 22 and 23 year old engineers who had just graduated with their bachelor's degrees. They weren't master's level, doctorate level people. These were all literally kids that had just graduated from college. So they set the sights on it. And then it was off to Paris where Jackie absolutely dazzled um, de Gaulle. Of course she spoke fluent French, she spoke, spoke fluent Spanish. She spoke fluent Italian, and so obviously she would speak, and, and uh, she, they, went, they went head over heels for her. And it, Tish, Baldridge, Tish Baldridge writes about being in the hotel way ahead of them, watching this motorcade coming down, coming down the, the street where people screaming, Jackie, Jacqueline, Jackie. And again, she was at least as popular, if not more so, than he was. Um, and it was a... Um, they had, they had their talks. De Gaulle was absolutely enthralled with her. He had said the year before when he had met her at, at an embassy dinner, the only thing worth taking back to France from America is Jackie Kennedy. And then it was on to, the so to Vienna and the Soviet Union. And this was funny. You'll see that photograph of her. That is her with Mrs. Khrushchev. This is kind of a very cute story, but it speaks to her, really her sensitivity, her, her thoughtfulness. Now, Mrs. Khrushchev could not leave a room, protocol. She could not leave any room that they were in together before Mrs. Kennedy. She always had to be behind Mrs. Kennedy. And it had something to do with international protocol because he was a, pre President Kennedy was a, was a president, head of state. Uh, premier Khrushchev was simply a premier. He was the leader of an oligarchy. So therefore, in the, just the protocol, the pecking order, that, and Jackie was embarrassed because she had care for this woman. This is an older woman. So her thing was, I, gotta, I should take care. So basically, she arrived, and you know, Mrs. Khrushchev got a very nice 
round of applause as she went into the building. And Jackie showed up and the place was going crazy. They're chanting for her and everything else. So Jackie goes inside, they're outside, and they're all chanting for her. And she went over to Mrs. Khrushchev and she said, come with me. She said, they want to see you too. And she, they walked over to the window for this photo. So she was, and they said that Mrs. Khrushchev afterwards, she was, she was gaga. She was telling, did you see what she did? Did you know? It was that kind of thing. And then you have Nikita Khrushchev, who two years earlier, three years earlier, had banged his shoe on the, on the podium at the United Nations, screaming, we will bury you. Our system will survive outside. We'll outlive you. A very bombastic little fellow. Um, not known for being particularly charming, so Jackie shared dinner with him. And uh, the president had said to her, he said, listen, just don't talk to him about politics. Talk about anything else. So Jackie was very, very well read. Her degree was in French literature from college. A very, a very, very, very astute historian in her own right. So she had read this novel, and the novel was about... Um, it was about battles in the Ukraine, war in the Ukraine, and all this. So she sits down, and she's having dinner with him, and she mentions the novel to Khrushchev. Well, Khrushchev goes on a litany of what we've done in the U communism in the Ukraine. We now built more schools. And he's, going, he's just going on this campaign speech. And Jackie just looks at him, and she goes, oh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Mr. Chairman, President, don't bore me with that stuff. The romantic stuff is far more interesting. And this is the photograph of him. The photographs all over, that was a headline, Krushi twinkles at Jackie. But I mean, it was basically, he literally melted. There were articles in newspapers all across the country about how he literally melted like a little schoolboy and, uh, in the presence of Jackie. So that was in June. And then in July, we had um, our, the second suborbital flight. Gus Grissom went up just like, just like uh, Alan Shepard had, he goes up, comes down, 15 minutes only, he almost becomes the first guy to die in a space flight. And you can see that in the middle, because Liberty Bell 7, the hatch blew too early, it filled with water, he got out, and then he almost drowned because the spacesuit was filling with water. That sank to the bottom of the ocean, it was raised in 1999, taken up by um, Robert Ballard, had done it with uh, National Geographic or the Discovery Channel, I think. They pulled it up, you can see that there, after sitting there for, for all that time, 30 some odd years. They raised this on the 30th anniversary of our landing on the moon, July 20th, 1999. And Gus Grissom turned out to be my favorite astronaut. Um, February 14th, 1962, Jackie now unveils what she's been doing at the White House for a year. Those of us, I don't know if any, did anybody here see this live at the time? Uh, yeah, um, it was pretty, it's pretty cool. It holds up pretty well. Now you can see it on YouTube. Um, and basically with Charles Collins with CBS, and she took everybody on a tour and basically talked about what they were doing. So in one year, they had become pretty successful at it. So that's February, that's February 14th. Well, we also, uh, maybe a week later, we sent uh, our first man into orbit. Now, I, can't remember, I, remember, I remember in school, we would gather out on the, I went to the Humphrey School in Weymouth. It was a two-store thing, four rooms. We had two TVs, one upstairs, one downstairs. We all sat crisscross applesauce on the floor and watched the 17-inch Zenith black and white. And we watched the space flights of Glenn and Grissom and, and, and Shepard. But I do, re I do remember this, and he went into orbit for, uh, for three months. We almost lost him. Um, and that happened. This thing was, he was originally stated for January 16th to go up. But what transpired through all of that fuel tank postponement to January 20th. Um, then that day, it was bad weather, bad weather for a week. On the 27th of January, everything was good. Cloud cover caused another delay, another postponement 20 minutes away from launch. I don't know if you remember that. There was a lot of that. T minus what and holding. And sometimes it would hold for, for hours. Um, and actually, NASA was, was happy that that delay had come place because they were a little bit leery about the booster that might not have been quite ready to go. But everybody's got the, the, the foot on the pedal. Let's get this going. Because the Russians, at this point, they had put a guy up who had done 17 orbits. So now we're falling way behind. But anyway, the next day it was set for February 1st. They find a fuel leak. Um, another two-week delay. So on February 14th, when Jackie did, the, uh, did the, the tour of the White House, it was supposed to be then. Once again, it was bad weather. 
On the 18th of February, it finally broke. And on February 20th, finally, uh, he suited up and was launched into, uh, into space. Uh, there were ticker tape parades all over the place. The ticker tape parade in Cape Canaveral. President Kennedy went to Cape Canaveral. That's him in the middle. You see, uh, you see him in the middle. He's, um, he went right out after Glenn landed safely. He talked to Glenn on the phone, went right out to a press conference on the White House lawn. He then went to Cape Canaveral. He went down to see him. You can see in the picture on the right hand side there, he's wearing a helmet. That's a hard hat helmet. JFK hated putting hats on, hated it, would not do it. He proudly put that helmet on that they gave him. That was the hard hat helmet from Cape Canaveral that they would wear when they were working on the... Um... And then in the bottom right hand corner, Glenn then came to the White House. Glenn went ticker tape tick parade from the White House up to the Capitol where he addressed Congress and all was... Uh, and all was well. Him, Grissom, and Shepard addressed Congress. And interestingly enough, John Glenn said, hey, if one of us die, don't stop doing this. Grissom would die in 1960 and 1967 with the, with the fire on the launch pad. The next guy up in May was Scott Carpenter, another free orbit thing, just duplicating Glenn's flight. Scott Carpenter was so enamored with what was going on in space, he fired his retro rockets to re-enter re three seconds late, landed 250 miles away from the pickup, the ship, and never flew again. Basically, he didn't care. He was so caught up in what was going on, he was not paying attention to any of the details, and it was 250 miles. Um, he ended up becoming an aquanaut, and actually, for a number of years, he held the record for living for 29 days in a biosphere under the water. Um, he was quite a character. In 1962, Newport became known as the Summer White House. Um, this is um, a couple things here. Uh, September, they spent about 25 of the days in September, the Kennedy spent in Newport, and they were conducting business from it. A couple things went on from there. Um, this is the America's Cup races were in Newport that year. This is uh, the photograph on the left is a particularly fav particular favorite of mine. But that is at the Breakers, dinner at the Breakers. If you go to the Breakers, you'll see if you walk in, and you, when you get in that, that big main room in the front, this was right on the left-hand side of that is where the head table was. Um, and up the top right-hand corner, that's also, that's coming into the Breakers. They were hosted by the, uh, by the ambassador to Australia. Um, great night. Kennedy gives a great speech that night on our attraction, human's attraction to the sea and the body makeup of the human body being 76% water and 76% of the earth is covered with ocean and, and that kind of stuff. Then you see the bottom two on the right, uh, that's on the USS Joseph P. Kennedy, um, where they hosted a bunch of folks and it turned into like a floating uh, dining room, if you will, while they watched the America's Cup race. And that's in, that's in September of 1962. And a month later, the USS Joseph P. Kennedy would be running would be running uh, blockade lines in Cuba for the Cuba, during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, the one in the middle up top where she's wearing the yellow dress, that is at the Elms in, uh, in Newport. Jackie had an issue, great, great, very, very interested in preservation of history and maintaining history and chronicling history. The Elms was about to go under. Um, it ended up being bought by the Newport Historical Society just before this, but in July of 1962, that was ready to go. They were going to literally raise it and put a parking lot there. This massive edifice that had been built in 1903 or whatever, and they were just going to level it down. The Newport Historical Society bought it for like $175,000, and now, of course, it's open for tours. But what Jackie did is in September, Jackie announced the plans, which she is unveiling there, and that photographs the plans for the, uh, the uh, Washington Center for the Arts which ultimately would become John F. Kennedy Center for the, for the Arts. Um, obviously, she didn't know that at the time that that would be the case. But if you look close in the background, you'll see Paul Newman's in the background, Joanne Woodward, Danny Kaye, some of the actors there. But that was at the Elms. And there was a two-day trip that the president took in the middle of all this, September 11th and 12th. Again, his interest in space. You can see this. Uh, top left-hand corner, that is in Huntsville, Alabama. You'll notice the rockets. And, and now, now we are still, at this point in time, we've had two orbital flights and that's it. But what you see around that is all stuff that's heading for the moon, okay? 
Those rockets behind are the Titan rockets in the top left. Those would be used in the Gemini program. In the middle, you'll see that. That's also a Titan rocket. Um, I'm sorry, that's the Saturn rocket. That's an early Saturn rocket. That's the ones that we use for the moon. The Titan rockets are in the middle. Up in the upper right-hand corner of Cape Canaveral. So he went to Huntsville, Alabama, and then he went to Cape Canaveral. That's Wally Sherrard up there on the right-hand side. Sherrard would orbit six times. And actually, he would become the voice. He was sitting next to Walter Cronkite. Um, at the, D, the desk, the CBS desk, when we walked on the moon in uh, 1969. Moving back this way, lower right-hand corner. That is in, um, <clears throat> excuse me, he went, he, that's in Houston. What that behind him is called, it was called at the time, the bug. That became the lunar module, okay? That was the first early design of the bug, and that was going to take, that's, and that ultimately became the lunar module that, when they separated going to the moon, that's what went to the surface of the moon. And then this one here on the left was at McDonnell Douglas in St. Louis. So he went to four cities in two days. All of this had to do with the flight to the moon. This is him looking at a mock-up of the Gemini because we went to Gemini. The Mercury was solo flights. The Gemini were two people. We knew we'd ultimately need three people. So every flight that went for all of these was all, and he wanted in on all of it. That little thing you see in the middle, I saw that, that was just cute as heck, I had to put it in the book. I actually talked to this guy. Um, this family, and this, was hap this happened all over the place, there were tons of letters. Third grade classes sending pennies into the White House. This is for the moon race, this is for this. So this is, the guy inside that little uh, capsule is Fred Flintstone, people. Uh, and I remember Fred Flintstone. Fred Flintstone was easy to draw. Even for us that were lame at drawing, Fred, Fred, Fred Flintstone was pretty easy to do. So this young man named Mark Zemenkis actually, um, actually uh, drew that and sent it on with his two brothers. There was a letter from the mother. There was $7 in it. All of this stuff was all, but this is what was happening. People all, we wanted onto the moon. I mean, that's just kind of what it's like. Fred Flintstone, what could be more American than Fred Flintstone on his way to the moon? Wally Shira in, in October of 62, he would go six orbits. Every time there was a, an astronaut did something, every flight, every space flight, all of the astronauts would come to the White House. He'd have them individually, and then all of them would come. Um, this is his, he did, he did six orbits, so he doubled the three orbits of both, of both Glenn and Carpenter. This is his family at the White House. What is interesting about this photograph is this photograph with the family was taken on the first day that JFK became aware of the missiles in Cuba. Okay, what this is, you'll see that in the upper left-hand corner. This, JFK gave this to all of the guys involved in the Cuban Missile Crisis. What that is, as you can see, it's just a calendar of October 1962. You will notice that the dates from the 16th to the 28th are emboldened. They're heavy. He gave one of those to Jackie. If you see up in the top left-hand corner, it says JBK. The top right-hand corner, it says JFK. So all these guys got their initials in it. And he gave that to them simply as a reminder of how close we came. The last, uh, Gordon Cooper, this was the last flight of, um, of, of Mercury. This was the last space flight that, Jack, that President Kennedy would actually be alive for. It took place in May of 1963. You'll notice in this photograph, this is Gordon Cooper, and he's sitting in JFK's rocking chair. But this was kind of a, uh, Cooper was kind of a funny fellow, uh, very interesting guy. And actually, Gordon Cooper was, um, he, along with a couple of other guys, actually was one of the astronauts that came out and talked about what they felt were alien encounters while they were in, while they were in space. He's a, he's a pretty interesting cat, but this is all of them uh, gathered, around, got, gathered around the White House and Cooper plopping in JFK's rocking chair. Now this begins the last summer of, of, the, of Camelot, if you will. Um, and again, getting back with Jackie, um, Jackie was pregnant at the time, and on August 7th she was due about the middle of September. And on August 7th, while she was on the Cape, um, she had just dropped Caroline off with a Secret Service agent at an equestrian event on the Cape. And she looked at Paul Landis, who was the Secret Service agent. She said, Mr. Landis, I think we better get going. And he got it back. So she was scheduled to go to Walter Reed. Um, she ended up in an emergency cesarean section at the Otis Air Force Base, at the Air Force Hospital. Um, President Kennedy was in Washington at the time. He arrived, uh, the baby was baptized immediately, and within 39 hours, 
Patrick Bouvier Kennedy was dead. Um, he had the same thing that John F. Kennedy Jr. had had, but he was also about eight, nine, ten days more early in his birth. And basically, all you did with that is you either the, the kid either made it or they didn't. You know, it was kind of like rheumatic fever way back in the day. There wasn't really any treatment for it. They either did or they didn't. Although, Patrick ended up in a hyperbaric chamber in um, a children's hospital in Boston. Um, and actually, Jackie spent 10 minutes with him, and that was it. He was wheeled in, and she spent 10 minutes. She just kind of stroked his hair in 10 minutes, then he was off. Um, she had had a cesarean. In those days, you were kind of knocked out and wiped out for quite a while with that. Um, so she never went to the funeral. She never did anything. So her life with Patrick was, in fact, um, was in fact 10 minutes. That photograph on the bottom, I kind of like it. It's, um, they're coming back from the hospital. Um, and that's uh, the president and Caroline. And the hands of the guy in front is Dave, is Dave Powers. But that's when he had taken her to see Caroline. Um, Caroline was deeply affected. Obviously, John was too young, but he was deeply affected. She was deeply affected by the passing of Patrick, as were they all. Photograph to the left is one of my favorites. Um, they're walking hand in hand. And basically, this death of Patrick, everybody who was involved with them and understood them said that this was a, um, he was, it was a transformation in their relationship. Um, his philandering it decreased to minimal, which I guess is good compared to what it was. Uh, but really, they actually um, they saw things that they had never seen before. This is one of them. Public displays of affection were never, ever seen. And the fact that when she left the hospital, they walked out front, and they were, uh, they were in fact, holding hands. Um, Jackie said in the tapes, in her tapes, that when he came back after Pat, he was with Patrick when he died. And when he came back and saw her, he literally literally sobbed in her arms. And she herself said she, that's never, something she never expected from him and that it really gave her hope for them. Um, and this really adds to the tragedy as we move, as we move forward. But, um, and she said at that time, she said, Jack, the only thing I couldn't stand, I couldn't bear to lose would be you. She said that to him in August. Uh, the following week was Joseph Kennedy Sr.'s 75th birthday. Um, they were an Irish family who sang a lot. Uh, I can remember my Irish grandfather singing Galway Bay at every family gathering we had. Um, one of uh, Jack Kennedy's favorite song was September Song. And um, these precious days, the one of the great lines in it, these precious days I will spend with you. He actually sang that song to his father that night. This is in Hyannisport. And then in the lower left-hand corner, You'll see that the golf, that's golf in, um, in Newport, at the Newport Country Club. The following week was the 10th anniversary, their 10th wedding anniversary. They had that there. That is uh, Ben Bradley is on the right. The president is on the left. Jackie and Tony Bradley are in the, in the cart. Um, and Ben Bradley wrote in his book, he said, I had never seen them. I had never seen, they embraced each other like I had never seen them embrace each other. The first time they had seen them since the, uh, since the death of Patrick. Uh, October, the following month, October 1963. On the left-hand side, that's all the original astronauts with JFK. They were given, they, they were awarded the Collier Trophy, which I guess is an aviation honor. Uh, it had been given out since 1912, and they had, they, all the Mercury astronauts were given that award. Um, it's also his last trip to Boston. If you look at the photo on the right, that's Harvard Stadium. That's the president at a Harvard and Columbia football game. He is right here, Senator Muskie, Dave Powers, Kenny O'Donnell, and that's Larry O'Brien. Those three were known as the, the Irish Mafia. Um, Halftime during that game, JFK said to Kenny, he said, Dave Powers, he said, I want to get out of here and I want to go see Patrick's grave. I don't want anybody to follow us. So they left, Secret Service left with them. They hijacked the press, kept them all bagged up in the parking lot, and they took off. And that is when uh, and Jack looked at, at Dave Powers and said, um, he seems so lonely here. Dave Powers relayed that story to Jackie on the plane as they were coming back from Dallas. And Jackie's response was, I will bring them together now. So Jackie ended up going to Greece for two weeks on the yacht Christina with her sister and Franklin Delano Roosevelt Jr., who was Under Secretary of the Navy and his wife. And um, she, uh, she had five pregnancies 
two children. Miscarriage in, in 1955, as I mentioned to you, 20% of pregnancies end in miscarriage. The stillborn in 1956, 1% uh, <clears throat> of pregnancies end in a stillbirth. Uh, Patrick living for 39 hours in 1963, 25 out of 1,000 infants died in their first year. She came back from that. That's a great photograph because uh, Jackie is, uh, the president brought the kids, this is in, this is in Newport in Quonset, Rhode Island, uh, to meet their mom coming back. And, um, and that's the, Cecil Stoughton, the photographer, White House photographer, got this shot. She immediately stayed on because she didn't want a lot of photographs, but he got a great shot there. She told uh, Mr. Clint Hill, her Secret Service agent, after this trip, I'm feeling better, Mr. Hill, and I'm going to Texas with the president um, next month. Also in that month, two things happened. First of all, you'll notice it says Kennedy's to occupy a state here in 1964. Um, the Kennedys came to like Newport much. We always associate them with Hyannisport. They actually grew to like Newport better. And they like Newport better because two reasons, actually. First of all, it was very, it's very high celebrity content, if you will, in Newport. So even though he was the president and it was a big deal, it wasn't a bigger deal of him being there as president. 18 of 35 presidents by the time he been, had been in Newport at one point in time. Eisenhower used to go there all the time. A lot of presidents visited there. A lot of celebrities visited there. So it wasn't really, it was just more private for that reason. Um, also, they had bigger estates, easier to keep people away. Um, they moved every year they were in Hyannisport. First year they were with the old man's house, second year they were around the corner, third year they were around the corner further, but still it was drawing all kinds of crowds. So on November 1st, they signed a lease to summer at uh, Annandale was the name of this, right near Hammersmith Farm, um, and they were going to be there for the months of um, uh, July and August. Uh, that and they, the White House announced that. On the right hand side, that is the bar backyard of a place called Atoka. It was a house that they had designed and built in Middle, Middle, Middleton, Virginia. Um, it had just finished. They spent exactly two weekends there. Uh, and they spent the last weekend in October and the first weekend in November there. And this is the last weekend. Uh, as you can see, Caroline's on the swings, just in the backyard. Jackie loved it because she could ride. Um, and it was, it was close to Washington, so this was kind of the end. They're, they're going to be their spot. They spent two weekends there. On November 21st, 1963, they begin the trip uh, to Texas. It begins in San Antonio. Uh, if you see that thing on the left, this fella right here, uh, it's not showing up. This guy here is Gordon Cooper, um, the astronaut. And actually, he was there. This was the dedication of a biomedical center, Space Biomedical Center in San Antonio. This whole trip, he was talking about space. Every speech he made, he's talking about space. The two undelivered speeches he made, there were, there were references to the space race in there. Um, but uh, he said to Gordon Cooper, why don't you come to Dallas with me tomorrow? I could use some help in the Dallas motorcade. It'd be nice having an astronaut with me. He said, I can't, Mr. President. He said, I got, he had to stay there. He was, he was working. The other, uh, the other photograph, you look down the lower right, you'll see Jackie, the back of a hat. Um, and once again, Jackie was taken over. She was going to Texas. The reason they were going to Texas was threefold. They needed to carry the state. They didn't win it by very much. And it was in danger of being lost. JFK had put the civil rights package together. Texas was a segregated state. This was a campaign trip for sure. There was a rift in the Democratic Party between Johnson and Conley and Re Senator Yal Ralph Yarbrough. He wanted to patch that together and he wanted it to be seen. Having Jackie was an enormous, an enormous advantage and he knew it immediately. They landed here. Protocol is, when a president deplanes, he's the first one out, everybody else follows him. That door swung open in San Antonio. There were about 10,000 people at the airport, and they're screaming, Jackie, Jackie. And the president, you can see it in the film, the president starts to step. He assesses the situation. He steps back. He puts his hand on Jackie's back, and Jackie goes down first. She did it on every plane flight throughout the trip to Texas. He just said, boom, I'm backing off. Um, and you can, see, you can see the response. November 21st, that night, they go to Houston. Two things take place in Houston. The first one is, is um, 
there's a there's a convention uh, of the League of United American Latin Citizens that's at the Rice Hotel. So they stop at the Rice Hotel, they're going to freshen up, and then they're off to the Houston Coliseum for a dinner for Albert Thomas, who was a a, a old-time Texas congressman, great supporter of the space race, and he was having a fundraiser, so they were going there. They were told at the LULAC convention, they said, he's going to stop in, come to the door, he's going to give you a wave, but he can't stay. He gets there, he goes in, Lyndon Johnson, Lady Bird Johnson come in, the place goes crazy, he sits down, they do a song, they play a song, he gets up, he says a few words, and then he calls upon Jackie. He said, in order that you may understand me better, I'm going to ask my wife to say a few words. She gets up and delivers a two-minute speech completely in Spanish, brings down the house. There was one young woman there who 50 years later in an interview, she said, once Jackie spoke in Spanish, nobody cared that the president was here. And it was really that simple. That night, they went over on the right-hand side. You see her looking. The president is giving a speech about Albert Thomas. And um, she remembered... Later on, she said the only thing she remembered about that speech was he actually quoted, he quoted the book of Acts. And in the book of Acts, he, she remembered this. Young men will see visions, your old men will dream dreams. And then he closed the speech with Albert Thomas is young enough to see visions and old enough to dream dreams. So in all of it was said in that. What really gets lost in the trip to Texas is how unbelievably successful it was until the end. It's kind of like the perfect example of that expression the operation was a success, but the patient died. They accomplished everything they wanted to in Texas and more in terms of what that, and you'll see that as we kind of go forward. Then it goes on to Fort Worth. Now they're arriving in Fort Worth at 11 o'clock at night, expecting just to boom, and off they go. You can see that on the left-hand side, Fort Worth. This is what they do with holidays in Fort Worth. They did it for the president as a welcome to the president and the first lady. You can see the, uh, the newspaper the next morning. Um, and the crowds were unbelievable. Kids were taken out of school. This is 11 o'clock at night. In the dark, they're lining the motorcade. And they're just absolutely gleeful at the arrival of the, uh, of the president and the first lady. And as you can see in that photograph, Jackie's first off the plane, coming down the ramp. So they spend the night in Fort Worth. And the next morning, I mean, Fort Worth was, was incredible. They had 5,000 people out, outside the hotel the next morning. It had rained all night. They started arriving. There is great, I went to Dallas. There's an un, there is, they have 1,700 oral histories of folks from the area who were there at some point or another that give their oral histories. It's absolutely fascinating to listen to. I don't think I'm going to get all 1,700 of them in before I die. But I did get about 60, 65 of them in uh, with the week that I spent there. Um, but once again, what you'll see here, the top left, he walks out. And, and first thing he says, they get there, where's Jackie? First thing he's getting is, where's Jackie? And he said, you know, she's upstairs getting ready. Made that famous thing, but she's, she's, you know, she's getting ready. Takes her a little bit longer to get herself ready then it takes us, but then again, she looks better when she does. Um, so they, that was, he gives a little speech, about, about maybe a seven, eight minute speech on a flatbed truck out there, and then he goes inside to the breakfast. Now the breakfast, um, there's about 2,500 people there. Clint Hill has got the agenda, and on it it says breakfast, and he sees in his agenda, it's crossed out, and it says JBK will not attend. So he's just upstairs. He's kind of got the morning off a little bit because Jackie's just in the room doing a thing. And um, he gets a call. The president wants Jackie downstairs. I mean, they're all waiting for Jackie. I've watched films of this. Jackie's absence is the story of the morning. And I'm talking about a play-by-play. -play. And the guy, literally, a newsman with a microphone saying this. And the maitre d' is pouring the coffee for the president right now. And, uh, oh, he has not turned over mrs kennedy's coffee cup it looks like she might not be coming and then he goes back down and then he's making back up and he comes back up and the guy's going still nothing in mrs kennedy's i mean this is this was the story of the morning so then clint hill gets a call and says the president wants the president wants uh jackie mrs kennedy down here and he says mrs kennedy's not coming it's the president wants her down here and he wants her down here now okay so he goes mrs kennedy the president wants you downstairs blah 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 so there is a woman reporter in the kitchen. She enters through the kitchen, and there's a woman reporter in the kitchen. Jackie comes through, and the place goes crazy. 
And she wrote about the fact women fully dressed up in high heels standing on chairs so they can get a better look at Jackie. Mind you, this is a highly Republican town. I mean, the whole front table is virtually all Republicans. And he didn't, he, Nixon get 62% of the vote in Dallas, okay? And, now this is, and this is Fort Worth. All of these folks, the mayor and everything else, the, the mayor's wife, Cornelia Freeman, who just died a year and a half ago, she said she walked in looking like some mythological creature, and he's standing there looking like the all-American boy. She said none of us had voted for him, but by the time it was over, we were absolutely enthralled, just like everybody else was. Um, so anyway, he gets the famous, the, he begins his, the final speech of his life with, two years ago I introduced myself in Paris by saying that I was the man that had accompanied Mrs. Kennedy to Paris. I'm getting somewhat that same sensation as I travel around Texas. And that truly was true. They saw a million people in less than, in 36 hours. And uh, all along the motorcade route. And only 10 million people lived in Texas at the time. Now you'll notice at the bottom right, once again, they're leaving. They now take a motorcade over to Carswell. They're leaving and they, um, and once again, they're holding hands as they, uh, as they get on board. Um, as the president went up the ramp, Mrs. Friedman, who I mentioned earlier, she looked at her husband and she said, I hope they behave themselves in Dallas today. And they were leery of Dallas. Lyndon Johnson and, El and Lady Bird Johnson. Johnson was a Texan. And in the campaign in 1960, he had been spit upon in a crowd um, because they didn't, they ran, they ran ads in the newspaper, wanted for treason with, with, with uh, tr uh, mug shots, similarities of the president and all the lists of why he wasn't doing what they thought he would do. So there was Adlai Stevenson, his, his ambassador to the UN had been there the month before. He had been hit over the head with a placket and spat upon. And there was some trepidation. Um, and when Jackie saw it, he said, they said, we're going into nut country today, basically. Well, we all know that's, and as he's, he's waving, to, that's a great photograph that was taken by a, 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 a Fort Worth star reporter, uh, a photographer. And literally, I mean, that's it. That's goodbye in more ways than one. And then, of course, Dallas. There's no two photographs that kind of give you the, the juxtaposition of that. Um, what transpired in Dallas? Uh, up to the moment, 225,000 people those, crowded those streets. And again, Jack, as much for Jackie as anything. Um, and as they, as they get to the end of Main Street, and Dave Powers says to Kenny O'Donnell, Kenny, he said, he said what, what's the story on time, Dave? He's, and he said, it's, we're five minutes late. He said, we're only five minutes late. They get to the end of Main Street, and Kenny O'Donnell says to him, I'll tell you one thing, this is a state we're going to carry. And it was all because of Jackie, primarily. I mean, the unbelievable force that she was. She had actually said to him while they were in the hotel room in Fort Worth, she said, Jack, she didn't like campaigning. She had a blast. Jack, campaigning with you and your president is so easy, I'll go any way you want. And he looked at her and he goes, California in two weeks? And she said, I'm there. And he said, Ken Kenny O'Donnell wrote in his book, he said, I was smiling like an ape. I couldn't wipe the smile off because they knew and she had. And he said, I know we're going to carry this. Well, Dave, Dave Powell said, to, gave them instructions through the motorcade. Don't look at the same voter. Jackie, you look over there. Mr. President, you look over there. Don't waste time looking at the same voters. We don't want to make eye contact with the same one. Make sure we sp spread you guys around. Uh, but he said to them, he said, you look like Mr. and Mrs. America. Um, anyway, they take the turn onto, from Main Street onto uh, Houston Street. And they're about 200 yards away from the Texas School Book Depository. And this is when, and the crowd kind of thins out in Dealey Plaza. And this is when Nellie Conley turns to, uh, to President Kennedy and he said, Mr. President, you can't say Dallas doesn't love you. And he said, no, no, you can't. So they go further down and they take almost, they got, it's a pretty tough left-hand turn that they take, they're now right below the Texas School Book Depository, okay? And as they make that turn, when they get into the Dealey Plaza, you look over, you see the triple underpass, which is a railroad bridge. And Jackie is thinking, now the day that started with rain and her in a wool suit, she's thinking it's gonna be pretty neat to pass through that. I'm gonna get a little shade, because she now, it's now noontime and she's hot. Um, and as they approach that triple underpass, of course, the shots ring out. Um, 
Jackie, we've all seen the photographs of Jackie on the back of the car. Um, she has no recollection of that, never did. She said, I don't remember doing that. Uh, I, I obviously know that I did because I see the photographs of me doing it. But she had no memory of that. Of course, Clint Hill jumps on the back of it. Um, and she is, either, she is actually gathering a, a portion of the president's skull, which was, which was, you know, just fired up into the air when the bullet struck his head. Um, so he gets her back down in. Um, and now, again, when you talk about the things that this woman endured. Now, I'll say this. Obviously, plenty of women have had a miscarriage. Plenty of women have had a stillborn. Plenty of women have had babies die in infancy. I don't know how many women have had all those three, and yet women who had all those three, I do know this. I'm fairly certain in saying none of them were riding in an open convertible also while they were reaching 18 inches from their, president, their, their husband's face and had his head get blown off by a bullet. So I'm fairly certain that puts her in a pretty unique, in a unique position. So she gets, um, she, she is basically in the hospital. Um, she refuses to leave the area. They wanted to leave the area. She's kind of maintaining herself. Um, people are literally coming to her and falling apart. Henry Gonzalez, who was a congressman, when he saw her covered in blood, he literally fell to his knees and was weeping. So it, she is, obviously she's in shock. There's a big, there's a huge fight for the, for the coffin because believe it or not, in 1963, it wasn't against federal law to kill the president of the United States. Um, it's a state crime. Texas was where the jurisdiction was. Texas law called for them to do an autopsy before they could release the body. So the medical examiner's there, he said she can't leave. And there, you know, so it's a tussle back and forth. Jackie's not leaving without the president's body. They're going back and forth. And ultimately, they literally end up with the C Kenny O'Donnell and the Secret Service men on one end, and this medical examiner, a couple of Dallas police officers, the other end of the coffin. And they're literally tussling over the coffin. And Jackie walks out from where she was. She puts her hand on the side of the coffin, and they just walk out, and they put it in the back of, a, of a, an ambulance, basically at that point in time. Now, Lyndon Johnson, as soon as the president is declared dead, Kenny O'Donnell goes and tells, excuse me, Mal Malcolm Kilduff was the assistant press secretary, gives him the word, so they've got to give him time to leave. Everybody is under the assumption he's leaving, he's going back to Washington. So they assumed he was going back, he'd be on his plane, he'd go back to Washington. So... Now there's a, now by the way, the Secret Service are in a little bit of a panic because they're thinking that the Dallas authorities may be coming after them to take hold of the body. So they just want to get on the plane and get the hell out, okay? This is a pretty unique photograph here. The one of the Air Force One, you can see the coffin being lifted. Um, this is taken from, actually, from the cockpit of Air Force Two which is on the other side. And you can see Jackie in the bottom there. Um, the coffin weighed almost 1,000 pounds. Um, they weren't going to put it down below. It wouldn't fit on the plane. They had to break the handles off to get it into the plane. And that's where Jackie sat for most of the trip. You can see on the right, uh, they, ended, went to, they went to Bethesda Naval Hospital where, they were, um, where the autopsy was held. Jackie waited up on the 17th floor. Um, but when she gets back on Air Force One, she now, for the first time, she's got like a minute, she goes into the bedroom to kind of gather herself, and Lyndon Johnson is laying in the bed, dictating a letter to his secretary. And she's, they're both startled. Johnson now jumps up and kind of fumbles and leaves. And the Kennedy people are going, I thought he was gone. You know, so there's this big confusion. He's waiting. He is waiting for the, the judge to come to swear him in. Um, for some reason, he thinks that matters. He can't be president without it, but it really doesn't matter. He was president. That's the moment that President Kennedy was declared dead. He becomes, he becomes the president. Um, anyway, he goes and talks to Jackie and, ja and talks about swearing in. Now, this is the first thing Jackie starts standing up to people because I want to change address. Everybody's telling him to change address. Everybody. Linda, Lady Bird Johnson, in her diary, in her oral history in the, in the LBJ library, gives a great account of it. She said, with such ferocity, if I can use that word, she just looked at, at, at all and said, I want them to see what they've done to Jack. So now you had that photograph that you saw of, of her, um, this one here. You can see that you can't really see any of the blood. 
And Cecil Stoughton was the photographer did that on purpose because, you know, they, they obviously were taking prayer. She was very gracious. She understood why Johnson, she should be there for the swearing in and the passing of the torch to the new president. I mean, this, this was, a lot of people thought this was a, they didn't know if it was an attack. We weren't sure if the Russians were involved, the Cubans were involved, but this was a highly, high, high security deal. You can see on the, in this photograph in the middle, she's getting off the plane. Of course, the other two, you can see how, how she is, how she is uh, literally covered in her husband's blood and, uh, and brain matter. Um, from Bethesda, she makes a call to William Walton. It says, make it as much like Lincoln's as possible. And of course, in Lincoln's, they had black crepe all over the place. So they went digging down in the archives, found the Lincoln catafalque, and they did this. The other question was Arlington or Brookline. Everybody assumed it would be Brookline. We're bringing them back together. That's where Patrick was buried. And Jackie remembered a conversation she had with him in 62 when she had come from a funeral at Arlington and said to him, uh, Jack, where are we going to be buried? And he went, I don't know, Hyannis, I guess. And she said, I think you should be buried in Arlington. So Arlington was still on the table. It was always on the table for her, not so much for the family. And it took a while. But on Saturday, Jackie went over. This is Sergeant Shriver, and I put him there because he was like the point man executing all of Jackie's playbook, if you will. Um, but this is, you can see that when the selection was made on Saturday afternoon, this is on Sunday morning. Rain, raining like crazy, and uh, there were three places over in Arlington. This was the one ultimately that she chose. And now, so she wins that battle. And then St. Matthew's or the Immaculate Conception Shrine. Immaculate Conception Shrine is relatively new. It's magnificent. It's huge. It holds 3,000 people. She said, no, St. Matthew's. And they go, no, well, we can't. it's an old crab. She said, that's where we went to Mass. We're going to St. Matthew's. Okay. So it's so on to St. Matthew's. It's a, it's a protocol nightmare because you get all these chiefs of state. You got 106 chiefs of state, foreign dignitaries that are coming to this. Um, but at St. Matthew's, Philip Hannon, this gentleman here. Philip Hannon was a 32-year-old auxiliary bishop in Washington, D.C. She wanted him to give the eulogy. And Sergeant Shriver says, you can't do that. She said, this is the head of state. It's got to be an archbishop. She looked at him and she said, Sarge, tell them I'm hysterical. It has to be Hannon. Philip Hannon delivered the eulogy. Philip Hannon would, would also pray over the graves of her children when they were reinterred. And that's him praying over her grave in 1994. He just died a couple years ago. He was a pretty interesting guy. He be, did become an archbishop, by the way. And then on, Tuesday, on Saturday afternoon, she says, oh, and there's going to be an eternal flame to these guys, and all of a sudden, now everybody's on the phone, How we get, hey, can we do that? How do we do that? What do we do? Isn't there one in Arlington already? Isn't there one at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier? She said, I don't care where there's one. There's going to be an eternal flame. So that gets put into motion, talking to the Pentagon. Um, now it's time for the eulogies in, in, the, in the Capitol. That's Senator Mike Mansfield, who was a very good, they were very good friends, um, and she wanted Mansfield. Uh, and. Sergeant Shriver said, no, he's just the majority leader. It's, first of all, it's going to be in the House. It's got to be Speaker McCormick. It's got to be this. She said, I don't care who you talks. I want Mansfield. Mansfield delivered the eulogy. So it was, and then the big one was she walked behind the coffin. And this, she, she went against the FBI. J. Edgar Hoover was out of his mind, the Secret Service, who had just lost the president, were very, very leery. Charles de Gaulle was going to be walking in this thing. And, um, and General Clifton first said to her, he said, he said, Mrs. Kennedy, you realize, she said, I don't care if nobody walks with me. I am walking behind the coffin. And she was going to walk from the White House to St. Matthews, then to Arlington. It's a mile from St. White House to St. Matthews. It's three miles from St. Matthews to Arlington. And she says, I don't care who comes. They don't have to. I'm walking. So General Clifton said, ma'am, they're not going to let you walk. They're not going to let a lady walk, and they're not going to walk. De Gaulle had had four assassination attempts. There was actually, Secret Service got word that there may, in fact, be an attempt on him during, the, during this, the funeral. So she settles with Clifton and says, okay, I'll just walk from St. Matthews, I mean, from the White House to St. Matthews. I'll do the one mile. Um, and then Clint Hill, the Secret Service, sent Clint Hill in one more time, see if you can get it a... And she said, no, Mr. Hill, they can ride or do whatever they want to. I'm walking behind the president to St. <laughs> Matthews. She walked, 106 leaders walked, 
President Johnson walked, they all walked. It's pretty impressive. People that were there talk about the fact that it was um, all you heard were the drums, the clicking of the hooves, and then whenever the band played. And of course the rolling of the, of the caisson. I will bring them together two weeks later on December 5th. She brought them together and the two babies would, were disinterred in Brookline and in Newport and uh, in a ceremony that was very, very small, closed down the cemetery um, and the two kids were buried next to their, next to their father. This is, um, this is kind of the way, this, this was the heart of her legacy, Jackie's legacy for sure. Um, for him, the two things were the Kennedy Library um, and of course Arlington. There have been probably 250 million people have visited Arlington since his burial there. Uh, there were 8 million the first year. Today, 4 million people a year visit the graves of both of them at Arlington. Um, the JFK Library gets about 150,000 people a year. Uh, she said that she wanted that to be a reflection of the times in which he lived, not just his presidency. It certainly has become that. But down in the middle there, you see that's Dealey Plaza, and that building there, um, that brown building, that's the, uh, that's the Texas School Book Depository. There's a museum there which opened in 1989. They get 400,000 visitors a year. It's the second most visited historical site in Texas behind only the Alamo. And that doesn't even count the people who just come and just walk around Dealey Plaza. Those are just people that go into the museum. There is something about these people, um, this administration. I'll give you two quick stories. One, I was, at the, I was at Arlington and I saw a young couple coming towards the grave. And I just kind of watched them for a little bit. They were in their early 40s. They had three kids, might have been from 12 to 7, maybe. And they were speaking Spanish. And I walked up to them and I asked them where they were from. They were from Barcelona. And I said, what brings you to Washington, D.C.? I mean, I just figured they were there for something else, whatever. He said, we, he said, we came to visit President Kennedy's grave. And I'm thinking to myself, I was like, I said, really? That's, oh, yeah, that's why. We'll, look, we'll see other stuff, but this is why we came. And I'm thinking to myself afterwards, these people have no living memory of President Kennedy, of the Kennedy administration, but yet they come halfway around the world to pay their respects at his grave. I was in Dealey Plaza last summer, and um, I'm out there early. I love watching people look at this stuff. I see a young guy, he's leaning, he's taking pictures. I go up and talk to him. His name was Jose, he was from Chile. He was 31 years old. I said, what brings you to Dealey Plaza? He said, well, he said, I'm flying to London. I had an eight-over layover at Love Field, and I had to come here. So I'm thinking, so this, there is something that still stirs folks about these, these people. I, I, don't know, I don't know what it is. Um, I, know why I, I know why it stirs me, but I lived it. Um, ultimately, you know, Jackie, um, this is what she was known for. And, and, and Fort Worth and that hotel suite, suite 850 in Fort Worth, the last night they spent together. They had, um, what they had done was they put the art collectors, the art dealers of the area got together and they had an art collection of 18 really high quality artworks. There were Picassos, there were Monet's, there were all of these things and this was, and they put together a pamphlet and it said an art display for President and Mrs. Kennedy. Um, and when they put it together, they did it not with him in mind, but they did it with her in mind. And, um, and this is, this is what she did. I mean, if you look at this, this is Robert Frost, uh, Pablo Cassell, Isaac Stern. That's the Mona Lisa. She brought the Mona Lisa to the United States. So there was a culture that was ingrained in the White House that had not been there before. And really, it kind of set it in motion. As I said, um, as I said, it's a, um, it's, it's something that you can't really put a finger on. Um, I'd, I'd, I'd like to think that it's hope. And, I'll, and I'll, I'll leave you with the story. A third grade boy asked me when I was a docent at the John F. Kennedy Library, um, do you know President Kennedy? Never met him. I said, nope. Well, what are you doing here? Good question. I said, well, I guess, I said, when I, I was your age when President Kennedy was president and he made me feel like my life could make a difference. So I guess I'm here to just pass on his message that, uh, that your life can make a difference. He wasn't all that impressed, but um, um, you know, maybe someday he will be. 
I'm going to leave you with a poem that Jackie wrote when she was 13 years old. A writer in her own right. And this was, uh, this was written after her first summer in Newport. And it goes like this. I love the autumn, and yet I cannot say all the thoughts and things that makes one feel this way. I love walking on the angry shore to watch the angry sea, where summer people were before, but now there's only me. I love wood fires at night. They have a ruddy glow. I stare at the flames, and I think of long ago. I love the feeling down inside me that says to run away, to come and be a gypsy, and laugh the gypsy way. Turtleneck sweaters, autumn fires, swirling leaves in the sky, riding my horse along the hills to say Alaska goodbye. The tangy taste of apples, the snowy mist at morn, the wanderlust inside you when you hear the huntsman's horn. Nostalgia, that's the autumn. Dreaming through September, just a million lovely things I will always remember. Jacqueline Bouvier, 13. Um, certainly a force in her own right. As I said before, I think she's one of the most powerful women of the 20th century. Um, what she has given up, I, I marvel. My eight-year-old granddaughter is gaga over her, and I have no idea why, and I, and I really don't care. But I thank you for coming to share a little bit. I hope you have a little bit closer look and appreciate those of us who lived through it, understood it, but as I relived it as a 60-year-old guy, looking back, came to a greater appreciation for it of just an unbelievable inner strength. Um, and actually, she was, uh, she was made Marion in Camelot. And she did one heck of a job. But thanks for coming, folks. Thank you. Yep. If you want.